Hello, everyone. Hi. Hello. Hi, Daddy. How are you guys? <laughs> so, I was going to address you guys first because this is an important topic to what you guys are uh, what you guys are growing up with right now with media. But uh, I didn't write it necessarily for kids. I put it together for adults. It's pretty wordy at times. Okay. Doug wants me to he wants me to yell at him out there. So. Yeah, yeah, you need to talk to the <clears throat> Okay. So can everybody hear me now? This is yeah, a little bit better. better. So I didn't put it together for kids. So if it gets really boring, that's okay. And uh, you guys can kind of go do other stuff. But if you <laughs> if if you want to listen and you don't understand something, just ask me and we'll kind of talk about it a little bit more. Okay. I'll try to maybe explain it a little bit more because I want everybody to really be able to understand the content of this. The 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 content of this talk is going to be a little bit different than maybe the content of the other talks, just because the Bible doesn't necessarily address media uh, in the most direct way that maybe it would address, you know, some of the other topics that we've covered. But I think that this, I think this will be good. I think we can kind of extrapolate some of this. Some of this is new theory that I've just kind of come up with. So. Um, be easy on me. It's not. Uh, I'm still kind of working some of these these things out. Um, but I would love to continue to get feedback on this and refine this as we as we move forward together. I'd love to get everybody's ideas on this. So um, let's just jump into what media is. So media um, media. When you think of it as a modern word, it, it connotes uh, sort of a wider array than what it might have traditionally. Um, first, the most commonly understood. Uh, uh, a definition for what media is. It's, uh, I have here, it covers the breadth of channels that humans use to receive and disseminate information. Okay, so we take and we give information, television, movies, magazines, advertising, podcasts, social platforms, Facebook, TikTok. Does anybody use TikTok? Has anybody used it before? No. No, like I heard five year olds use TikTok, right? What? <laughs> no. Um, TikTok is a is a social media platform that kids use to do lip syncing videos and that kind of oh, like share music, music, music things. Yeah. Um, but more recently, and in in kind of a broader sense, it's taken on the understanding of being a gestalt. A gestalt. It's sort of a living narrative of society's collective worldview. Okay, currently embraced and used by every social class, and studyable and manipulable by media theorists and propagandists, okay? So this is something we're gonna kind of talk about, we're gonna unpack this. So for the, where the term gestalt, does anybody kind of know what that means? We're gonna kind of unpack that a little bit. Gestalt, gestalt, gestaltic psychology or gestalt, it would be, uh, the best way I can describe it, uh, kids, have you guys ever seen a pointillism painting, like a Seurat? Like we, where you have, it's a bunch of points that look like little colors, but when you stand back, you see you see the picture as a whole, right? If you get really close, you just look like color points. Stand back, you get really good. Like dots. Like dots. That's right. That's right. So, what media is a lot of times it's sort of a, a conversational narrative that's a gestalt. Okay. All right. So let's talk about how. Ooh, well, I jumped down really far. Let me let me go back up real quick. Let's talk about how media has evolved. Um, so uh, I finished reading a book called *The Shallows*: What, in the, what the Internet Does to Our Brains by a, a, an academic author. Uh, his name's Nicholas Carr, just recently. And Nicholas Carr, uh, he's he does some excellent um, unpacking of how the internet has affected the way that we learn. But um, in particular, one of the things he starts out with, he starts out with the transition from spoken word knowledge to written knowledge, which was really a fascinating thing that happened in the in sort of the ancient uh, ancient. Uh, communities. Uh, somebody actually, one of the most famous uh, critics of this was Socrates, which is really fascinating. So I'm going to read you, I'm going to read you some, some quotes. This is, uh, Doug, I'm afraid that this, this talk's probably going to go over 18 minutes. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to go, I'm just going to try to unpack a bunch of stuff if I can. So this is what Socrates says. This is, uh, he says, you know, Phaedrus, writing shares a strange fe a feature with painting the offsprings of painting stand there as if they are alive but if anyone asks them anything they remain a most solemnly silent the same is true of written words you think they were speaking as if they had some understanding but if you question anything that has been said because you want to learn more it continues to signify just that the very same that just that very same thing forever when it is once been written down, every discourse roams about everywhere, reaching indiscriminately 
those with understanding no less than those who have no business with, business with it. It, it. Effectively, effectively, Socrates was really worried about the context of conversation, right? So if you write down a word, and you write down the word stop, right? But you don't talk about the fact that you're in a car and you're moving forward. It, it loses the context of what that is. And that's what Socrates was really worried about. And so uh, that was just like the very first, that was the beginnings of evolution of media from changing from a spoken word where I would, Ian, you and I would get together and we'd have discourse and we would chit chat, right? And you would ask me a question and I would challenge that and then I'd ask you a question and you would challenge that. And we would learn together through rhetoric and then it gets, it gets put into a written form where all of that context of conversation and learning is taken away, right? And that, Socrates is really worried about that. Effectively, Socrates and by proxy Carr argue with, the, for, uh, argue with the, the quotes that the simple transition of knowledge transfer from spoken mentorship to written word, removing both the true understanding of and philosophical under, undergirding behind the statement, leaving the reader up to a vacuum-based translation sans the appropriate context. Like that's, when, when we can't have that back and forth, and we can't have people that act as maybe a foil to what we're, sta what we're stating. We lose the ability to really think through problems. Mm -hmm. This is something that Christ really, uh, Christ was a master of through his parables, being able to speak directly into people's lives by, by, by illustrating um, um, <coughs> what was going on with them, you know? And it was, it was through rhetoric and through conversation that he was able to really reach people through that relationship. And a lot of times, you know, that doesn't happen necessarily through media. So, um, due to the growth of this contextual knowledge gap over time, people continue to gain access to information via media, sans philosophy, the, uh, the risk of manipulation uh, through propaganda continually rises. Okay, so this is a famous propagandist that I'm going to read a quote of. You guys know what propaganda is? Kids, you guys, you guys? Okay, Ian, I know you do because we've studied propaganda quite a bit. Propaganda is, is, is being able to manipulate people's ideas, uh, uh, or manipulate the, the way that a group thinks, uh, through uh, getting at their emotional needs. The, the man I'm going to read is a man named Edward Bernays. He was the, Edward Bernays was the, uh, the nephew of Sigmund Freud, and he was a, he was a brilliant propagandist that worked, for, uh, that worked both here in Europe and the United States. He said, this is, this is a quote from Edward Bernays, universal literacy was supposed to educate the common man to control his environment. Okay, so everyone being able to read, right? We were supposed to, uh, we were, it was this like liberating force. Once he could read and write, he would have a mind fit to rule. So, so ran the democratic doctrine. But instead of a mind, universal literacy has given him rubber stamps. Given him rubber stamps. Rubber stamps inked with advertising slogans, with editorials, with published scientific data, the trivialities of the tabloids and platitudes of history, but quite innocent of original thought. Each man's rubber stamps are the duplicates of millions of others. Mm -hmm. So that when these millions are exposed to the same stimuli, all receive identical imprints. Effectively, he's saying, when we give everyone this ability to have universal literacy and they can all read these words and we get and we can create an idea that's popular enough for everyone to accept, they all go, yep, that's right. That's right. There's no critical thought that's brought into the process anymore. So, since that time, since the time Socrates and uh, Edward Bernays was about the turn of the century, from 19th century to 20th century, that he was really working. Um, and he did some really fantastic and kind of crazy stuff, so it'd be interesting to, to look him up if you had time. Uh, we've seen lots of things evolve, right? We've seen, the, we've seen uh, uh, elements of media evolve, and the democratization of media, meaning that like all of a sudden lots of people have platforms, because we all uh, Facebook, we have Instagram, we have things that we can, where we can take information, we can disseminate it back out to groups. But let's give some examples of how, how media now <coughs> is positioned and how technology companies position uh, uh, media to influence people. First of all, language has fundamentally changed. So I, I have one, I have an example, I don't have a picture of it, I wish I had a picture of it, but 
um, where I gave it, I'm giving a, a scripture from Hebrews, uh, a scripture in Hebrew from Psalm that says, it just translate as, translates to blessed be to God and God, uh, when you unpack that as Yahweh and Yahweh, there's so much meaning behind that. <laughs> blessed be to God who did not remove my prayer and his kindness from me. And then I've got, uh, I've got that translated in directly into emoji characters. You guys know what emojis are? Mm -hmm. emojis? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and it's like, you know, the hands going like this and the God with the halo and the, the thumbs down, he's rejecting, you know, praying hands. And it's, it's interesting how language has been transformed by media. Language has been simplified, continue to be simplified. Now, is that a bad thing necessarily? That's, that's something that we need to continue to debate as media theorists. Mm -hmm. but, I, um, but, you know, it is something where it is removing a lot of context. Like Socrates was talking about, the context mm -hmm. is being taken away. Or psychologically, people are being manipulated. Neil Postman, one of the most famous media theorists of the 20th century, said Americans no longer talk to each other. This was in the 1970s. Americans no longer talk to each other. They entertain each other. They do not exchange ideas. They exchange images. They do not argue with propositions. They do not argue with propositions. They argue with good looks, celebrities, and commercials. Yeah. That was in the 70s. That was in the 70s. Gosh. Yep. Or, and this is the most recent thing, and this is something that a lot of people aren't aware of, biologically, in, uh, in technology, and in uh, specifically one of the group's, uh, one of the group's uh, Facebook, and uh, everybody's pretty much familiar with Facebook, a lot of the research that helped found Facebook was based on research into the, the limbic system responses to how we get addicted to things. So, um, Neuroscientist Shannon O'Dell, she says this, she says, functional MRI studies of teenage brains show increased activation in the visual cortex of the brain when viewing a photo with a significant amount of likes versus the same photo with only a few likes. This suggests that our brains intuitively pay more attention to something that has been arbitrarily rated better socially regardless of the content, okay? When viewing, uh, when viewing their own content, there's increased activation in the reward pathways of the brain uh, when their photos were accompanied with more likes. In other words, it feels good to know your brunch pick is resonating with your friends. Like it's, it's actually when, yeah, so you could post two different photos, the exact same photo, one has a lot of likes, one has no likes. You, you, are, you are hardwired biologically to respond to the one that has more likes when we see it. Also, uh, so uh, the social media, this is another, this is, there's other research, social media activates neural centers, the same neural centers that activate when you eat chocolate or when you win money. That's why we're eating so much money. Yeah, that's why we're eating so much money. Yeah, but, um, how, so when you receive a like, when you receive a like within social media, say you log into Facebook and you post something. Now, I know Facebook's an old platform, but let's say let's say we do a snap, right, on Snapchat, and um, and we have people respond to us. A bunch of people respond to us. Every time one of those comes in, it's the same, according to our brain, as eating a chocolate bar or winning money. Yeah. And so what development ha has done, and I know because this is this is the the field that I work in. We've developed languages like something called Vue.js, which is developed out of China, and React, which is actually developed by Facebook, where the c connection is all about microtransactional data, uh, data connections. So you never lose that state. That's the reason why you can stay logged into Facebook and those numbers keep popping up. One, two, three, at the very top. And you keep refreshing and refreshing and checking and checking and checking. That is your brain addicted, literally addicted, to the process of receiving those. And that, that's by design. That's by design. I know, um, I know you guys have probably heard some of this, but that's, that's good. So let's talk about media players. Uh, and uh, Doug, please rein me in if I go too far, okay? Let's talk about media players. I've sent a couple different pictures. Uh, we can just kind of run through these really quickly. The first one, the, first, the very first link that you've received on your WhatsApp oh, that's it, that's is a that's chart that's of media true. ownership in the United States, okay? This is a really interesting thing about media ownership. Most media ownership is only ha handled by a handful of companies. I don't think I don't think most people know know that. But um, 
If you look at that very first one, you can see, and you can probably see some familiar names in there, you know, ATT Time Warner, which actually Comcast just tried to buy, which would have made them a mega conglomeration, but fortunately the FTC shut that down. Disney, uh, Verizon, these are huge media companies produce lots and lots and lots of content. The thing is, these are all speak, being spoken from from one voice and one worldview. So we need to talk about that in particular. Now let's go to that next link. The next link just shows just, just what Disney owns. Just what Disney owns as far as media ownership. Now a lot of people see Disney and they go, oh, da, 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 you know, it's totally yeah, innocuous, Disney. everything's Doesn't fine. Disney, own Nintendo? Disney does not own Nintendo. Oh, they, no. own. they own Marvel though. Oh, they yeah. own Marvel? Yeah, they own Marvel. They own Star Wars, they own, Wars, they own yeah. so many publishing companies, they own, and they, if you look at the bottom left hand side, that's all the ownership that they have in Europe and international and abroad. There's the, uh, the, that's, you now it's, it's interesting because when you think of that being under a single umbrella, you ask, you have to ask yourself, okay, who's setting the, uh, the narrative here? Because somebody is setting a narrative. Somebody is saying, hey, we are going to promote a, a, a specific media message to this. You might want to explain what does it mean when you're setting the narrative. Okay, okay. Uh, thanks, thanks. So, um, when you own a bunch of stuff, right, and you want to have a, you want to have a conversation with people through that, um, you, you have maybe one person that will say, um, that will say all, all of our company is going to be kind of pointed in this direction. This is our sense of values and this is what we're going to be saying together. Okay. Does that make sense? So especially when you start seeing these bridges and start seeing the trees and who owns what you kind of, it starts revealing like, oh yeah, there's a lot of people that are there. I would think these were all individual companies that had their own say, but they're actually all one big company that has one say. So uh, the last one, I was going to point, point this out, Bertelsmann is, is actually here in Europe, so Europe's not immune to this. Europe's better about it with transparency, but Europe's not completely immune to it. That, that's just a list of their ownership as well, which is there are lots and lots of publishing companies, lots of magazines, lots of newspapers, lots of television outlets. They're all pointing to the same thing. So now we're going to go, we're going to kind of talk about technology a little bit and kind of go into that. So uh, what's technology? Technology is, uh, historically speaking, technology has always been seen as an applied use of human knowledge into making tools that make life better, right? That make life better. For instance, though different in application, a plow or an oven is as much a piece of technology as a particle collider. It is, right? It's We're applying scientific knowledge, we're applying uh, our know-how to a task, and we're coming up with some sort of tool that's gonna help us with that. Yet today, currently, a lot of the secular human, uh, secular humanist uh, worldview uh, sees technology as an evolutionary leverage point to bring us, bring humanity to a point of transcendence, right? This is something that's really come up in the last couple of years with a, 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 a group of people called the transhumans, okay? Transhumans are people that embrace the idea of cyborgism or using technology within their body to enhance humanity and bring us to a point where we are uh, where we are transcendent human beings. There's also another group that's working specifically, there are groups that are working out of, out of, uh, out of some of the tech centers, and I know that actually some, some of the, uh, the founders from Google are into this idea. The idea that human beings will eventually attain eternal life by becoming disembodied consciousnesses that are uploaded to hive mind technology. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so, the brain, human brain interfacing is a is a is a big buzzword right now within within my industry. Mm -hmm. Talking about how we can how effectively we can take all of our all of our memories and all of our emotions and we can pipeline them into a computer matrix and boom, out pops Eric in a digital form, living forever in a computer, and you become transcendent. Wow, mm. that's and that's that's mm. the that's the notion. Is this really big? Is this kind of a big movement now? Yeah, there, yeah, there are a lot of people, specifically out of Silicon Valley, that have okay. really have really embraced this idea. Um, this is something else that's kind of popped up. I wrote about just recently a group called the called the Way of the Future. This is from an article. Silicon Valley is play, is is a place obsessed with the future, but often forgetful about the past. Earlier this year, one of the valley's most controversial techies took a future a future worship to the next level by founding a religion called. 
called the way of the future. Its purpose is to develop and promote the realization of a godhead based on artificial intelligence. Okay. According to the public documents that were first reported by Wired Magazine. So, fascinating, we're, we're, we're moving to this place where we're like, we're going to create our own God, we're going to become our own transcendent people apart <coughs> from God. You know, we're embracing technology in this way. So this is grandiose, all of these, these ideas. So let's bring it back just a little bit. Um, media and technology, um, when we think about media and technology that we use, we think about these typically. We think about maybe our laptops. Um, these are, these are, but these are tools in their own way that can be extremely subversive that we need to be aware of. Media technology conglomerates seek complete authority over the informational transactions happening between sources and consumers. Okay, between Facebook and you, between Snapchat and you, between CNN.com and you. Um, they aim to do this by employing tools such as the liking hooks that, that I just talked about, like, right, you, like, 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 like. Um, 24 hour news cycles <coughs> when you only have two hours of news to talk about, right? Oh, I need to know what these 87 commentators are saying about the same thing for five hours straight. <laughs> and endless scrolling yeah. with AI curated content, right? So there's a reason why it, why Instagram keeps going and going and going and going and going, right? And actually, that content is all being curated by artificial intelligence that's based on researching your likes and your and the things that you like and and pumping that content back to you because they're trying to make your limbic system fire right they're trying to make they're trying to have a neurological response so that you stay on that page and keep going oh and turn into a zombie that's what they want right they want that cradle of grave informational loyalty so let's talk about what is this media message okay at the, this is a this is a book, an illustrated book. Um, uh, this is called the Medium and the Massage. This is an illustrated book, but the uh, the original text was written by a guy named Marshall McLuhan, who is a Canadian media theorist, one of my favorites. He was actually a Christian as well. Um, uh, seminal work uh, called the Media. The Media is the Medium is the message, and he said. Uh, yeah, he said the medium is the message, meaning that the medium rather than the message is the real subversive agent and should be our focus of our study. So this is this is the focus of our study, not the content that's coming through. Though I agree with him, I've, I've previously shown the medium is a critical factor. This is a critical factor. I also feel that general message promoted by secular humanist media is worth examining. In fact, I find the underlying messages behind most secular humanist media engaged today are there they're they're very similar and they harken back to some specific things. So I'm gonna read three, I'm gonna read three different elements, okay? I'm gonna read from Genesis 3, from Genesis 11, okay, and I'm gonna read from Nietzsche's uh, Thus Spoke Zarathustra, okay? So, Genesis 3, the serpent said to the woman, Surely you will not die, for God knows when you eat it will be from the uh, it, okay, so this is the part. When you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like divine beings, right? Well that's super critical. Who know good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree produced fruit and it was good for food, it was attractive to the eye, it was desirable for making one wise, she took some of the fruit and ate it. She also gave it to her husband who was with her. So it's really important to kind of hear that when you eat from the when you eat from it your eyes will be open you'll be like divine beings here's genesis uh, 11. the whole earth had a common language a common vocabulary when the people moved eastward they found the plain in, Sh in shinar and settled there then they said to one another come let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly they had brick instead of stone and tar instead of mortar and then they said come let's build Let's build ourselves a city and tower with its top in the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves, right? All right, so this, now we're gonna get a little, little different, right? So this is, this is this guy named Nietzsche, Nietzsche, Friedrich Nietzsche, Friedrich Nietzsche, I guess I pronounce it in German. Um, he would be, uh, he was a nihilist philosopher, okay? Um, so he said, this is something he wrote, he wrote this kind of narrative, and he said, all beings are, create, are so far have created something beyond themselves. And do you want to be the ebb of this great flood and even go back to the beast rather than becoming than, than the overcome man or the, the Ubermensch? <clears throat> what is the ape to a man, a laughingstock or painful embarrassment? 
and man shall be just that from the uh, for the overman, a laughing stock or painful embarrassment. So regular man, us in our sin and our fallenness, we need to become transcendent, conquering men, the Ubermensch, right? Um, uh, once the sin against God was the greatest sin, but then he says, but God died. He said, God died. And these sinners died with him. To sin against the earth is now the most dreadful thing, and to esteem the entrails of the unknowable higher than, uh, than the meaning of the earth. What is the greatest experience you can have is the hours of great contempt, the hour when your happiness too arouses your disgust, even when you reason your virtue, the hour when you say, what matters, is, uh, what matters my happiness? Is it the poverty and filth and wretched contentment? But my happiness ought to justify existence itself. My happiness ought to justify existence itself. So these, I'm going to argue that there's two specific narratives. That the secular humanist narrative is the same. And we can find this in popular media as well. It's not just the fall. It's not just the Tower of Babel. It's not just uh, Nietzsche. It's, it is, it's, the, it's the, uh, the narrative of Lars von Trier movies or the, or the Matrix. It's, the, it's, the, it's political narratives behind uh, social issues like, like um, LBG2Q rights. And there's, there's all of these things are woven into it. And what, what I see is a media message that is in some ways a false facsimile of the gospel. Let me break that down. I see it as the media saying, because God is unreliable, petty, and non-existent, boom, only through our work, whether individual or collective, can human transcendence be achieved, right? Mm -hmm. Now, what does the gospel say? Because God is 100% reliable, loving, and present, only through the work of his son Jesus on the cross can we come into right relationship with the transcendent. So we have taken God out and we've put ourselves in. And that's the narrative that's coming through in so many elements of, this, of, of the message. So God is in the way. God is the in the way. God isn't, we are transcendent. God yeah. is no longer transcendent. There, we have no faith. We have no faith, so we, ha we have no faith, so we have to respond to that. So, I could, I could actually do a whole nother talk from this point on, so um, if anybody's getting tired, seriously, if you guys want to go do something else, that's, that's okay too. I sent one more picture. I sent one more picture. This is, a, this, is the, this is a theory I'm working on. I call this the anger apathy continuum. And this is something I've come up with recently. And I wanted to, I wanted to kind of theorize a way that we responded to anger, or the way that we responded to this message, you know, as Christians, or the way we respond, everybody responds to it. So this funnel, I have, I have a few different things. I have the media at the top, and then I have, I have um, uh, technology basically being a dis distribution filter, and we take that in. And then after we receive this content with sort of an ambivalent mind, I believe that we fall into uh, we fall into a realm where we either receive it with anger or we receive this with apathy, right? This message. And this is not this doesn't just go for Christians. This also goes for people that are this also goes for people from other worldviews. And that that what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to divide over this issue based on kind of how we receive it and what our personality is okay so uh i think that i think that we do this because a lot of times our insecurity um when we don't find our security in in christ we respond out of one of these things and i'm going to talk about how the gospel continues to break this down so uh why do we respond out of anger as the flight, as a fight aspect of our dual of a dualist paradigm, part of the population will be compelled to respond with anger to this media message. Okay, so and I think that we break down to two different levels. I think we break down the arbitrary orthodox and arbitrary heterodox. People who so arbitrary or orthodox are people who dogmatically preserve, no matter the cost, a traditional or conventional way of life. Often these people are firebrand provocateurs who wield political and religious issues like weapons against their enemies. I think we've all met those people before, right? 
they, they, I think that you guys, uh, I think that Laurel's engaged to one of them, actually, right? <laughs> I think it's Emma. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Emma's engaged. Yeah. yeah. Arbitrary heterox traditionally promote non traditional liberal way of life. Similarly, these people in five brand provocateurs wield social and scientific issues like weapons against their beliefs. Right? Yeah. They will, you will, it is your backward thinking that is driving uh, us away from transcendence. You don't believe in science. You don't believe in science. Your backwards thinking is pulling it. And you know, but we also know people on the other side that are the fundamentalists that are going, if you would just throw the science books away, then we would, you know, we would never, you know, we never have these problems, you know. Uh, and that's that's not an answer either. Um, so and I believe that the media message inflames their passions by pushing an arbitrary orthodox into a de defensive position, arbitrary heterodox into an aggressive position. Um, and uh, for if the culture says that God is not real, that humans must work for transcendence, then orthodox feel threatened and heterodox feel emboldened. Uh, so, so, um, Let's now. I'm going to talk about the other side of the continuum. I know that I'm probably what 40 minutes or something now. So 30, 30 minutes. 30 minutes. Okay. Okay. I'm I'm going to try to continue wrap this up. So let's talk about apathy. Apathy, I think, breaks down on 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 the left and right to to two things. I think it breaks down to protectionism, and I think it breaks down to cynicism. So uh, why apathy? As, as the, this is so, we have the fight on one side and we have the flight on the other side, the flight aspect of the dualist paradigm. Part of the population will be compelled to respond with apathy to a media message. Protectionism allows people, so protectionism on, on one side, a more conservative side, allows people on the more conservative side of the apathy paradigm to remove themselves from, from, of their families from an exposure to potentially harmful society, right? Uh, utopian examples of these people would be Amish, the Hutterites, or uh, proponents of the, Be the Benedict Option. Um, you know, these are people who are, in, in some ways I can identify, they're very well-meaning people who want to keep their kids from things, but is, it, is that what Christ it's taught us to do? Cynicism on the reverse side would be people that um, they are, uh, they, they further remove themselves from the grounding truths of reality. They're not necessarily utopian in nature, Growing cynicism amongst young people has spawned absurdist and separatist movements, such as Dada, Dada in the past, you know, in the 19-teens. Um, the Burning Man Festival, which I'm, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with, which is all about deconstructing uh, uh, a, a traditional worldview. Um, and the new synthetic reality movement, synthetic reality movement um, that it espouses things like, uh, like you guys talked about, uh, influencers yesterday. So uh, there are virtual influencers. There are people. There are synthetic human beings. that are 3D. They're rendered. That are on Instagram. They are delivering media messages, and and people are following them and take their advice, even though they're just 3D people. Wow. They're becoming. People are becoming abs almost absurd in their in their um, in their removal of this from reality because they they feel like nothing is true. And they can't be. Uh, they have no control whatsoever. Does in virtual reality play in the uh, Virtual reality is not quite as far as synth synthetic reality is on purpose, trying to be, uh, trying to not be real. It's on purpose trying to be almost cynical in its nature, which is virtual reality is just more like uh, just trying to put you in a place. Um, so why do they respond with apathy? So, so they seem to feel a sense of being lost and not heard within the greater culture, driving them to a place when they desire simply to not participate in it. Right? So these are these two groups. So let's talk about the gospel. Let's bring this home, right? How are we supposed to respond to this? Okay? How does how does scripture break down this insecurity that we have that causes us to respond with anger and want to to fight or with apathy and want to run away. First of all, um, first of all, we know that God's nature is to love all people. Here's this from Jonah. The Lord said, you're upset about this little plant. You guys remember when Jonah's sitting under this plant, right? Yeah. And it dies. Yeah. You're upset about this little plant, something for you which have not worked, uh, which you have not worked, nor did you do anything to make it grow. It grew up overnight and died the next day. Should I not have been more concerned about Nineveh, this enormous city? There are more than 120,000 people in it who do not know right from wrong as well as many animals. God cares about the animals even. You know? 
So we know that God loves all people, right? So, so insecurity, like, there's no reason for us to be angry or pull away. We know God cares about these people that we're angry against or, or pulling away from. Then we also know that God sent his son Jesus to die. So you, you guys know these verses. For, God, for this is the way that God loved the world. He gave his one and his only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish and have eternal life. For God not only sent his, world, his son to the world to, uh, not, not sent his son to the world to condemn the world, but that the world should be saved through him. God loved us so much. We're all these Ninevites, right? We're all people who have rejected and done terrible things, but God sent his son even to die for us to stand in our way. And he, he calls us a priesthood nation. In, in 1 Peter it says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, the people of, own, uh, of his own, that you may proclaim the virtues of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You once were not a people, but you are now God's people, and you were shown no mercy, but now you have received mercy. Does that sound like a group of people that need to get arbitrarily angry and hate other people or pull away and say I'm writing them off and never going to talk to them ever again. No it doesn't. Not to me at least. So the gospel because the gospel comes in I see us as, as sanctified believers like Stephen we have been set free from the need to defend ourselves and to see others as we once were seen broken sinners like Christ uh, are able to walk with prostitutes and Pharisees alike, neither buying into the false ideas that either are made right apart from the work of the cross. And Stephen, Stephen, I mean, this is, it's so amazing. Stephen is going to be stoned by the Pharisees and he's, he's, he's proclaiming, he's proclaiming the gospel to them. And they, it says, they continued to stone Stephen while I prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my, my spirit. And he fell to his knees and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this against them. We said this, he died. And then Jesus has the final word, right? Jesus said, for judgment I have come to this world, so that those who do not see, do, who do not see may gain their sight, and those who see may become blind. So let's, this is my last point. Let's talk about how this applies to the kingdom and how we can make disciples within the kingdom. I think we can walk confidently in the knowledge of grace, right? Because we're all, we've all been there. Whether or not we're the people making media messages, or the people developing technology, or the people consuming technology, or the people who's had their lives destroyed and somehow by media or technology. We can walk confidently in knowledge of grace, embracing others where they, uh, where they, uh, in the same way that Christ embraced us, where they are. Right? And then I, I'm going to read this last scripture from 1 John 4, 17 through 19. By, uh, by this love is perfected with us, by this love is perfected with us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, just as Jesus is, so that we are in this world. There is no fear in love. But perfect love dries out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears punishment has not been perfected in love. We love because he loved us first, right? But our inclination is to respond. And my inclination is to look at this thing and go, this is a conduit for evil. It's not a conduit for evil. It's not necessarily a conduit for good. It's what we can do with it. You guys use media. Uh, to to proclaim the gospel and that's a wonderful thing to do you know we 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 can't take such a dualist notion and respond in insecurity what we have to do is we have to we have to step away from that insecurity and remember that we were loved first and that this and that this is a tool that's moving us forward but at the same time use wisdom regarding the worldview that's being displayed so that's all I've got I'm, uh, I hope that uh, made some sense. Thank you so much. <laughs>